just six days, the Rhythms of Life is almost finished. No, I've never done anything quite like this before. The dangerous part is when the ground is slippery and wet. If you take it carefully every, every step, it's amazing what can be done with these machines. These operators have never built a sculpture. They've never built a piece of land art. They're used to building houses and roads. So it's quite a challenge for them to move such giant rocks precisely. Precision in moving the rocks is vital because these structures are designed to be seen from the air. It's very important to have skilled operators so that we have really precise lines. As the last rock goes into place, the rhythms of life is complete. Obviously, standing here, you can't make any sense of it. And you're not sure if you're standing in the work or it's man-made or if it's the way the arrangement of the stones as somewhere when you walk around them sometimes they're in alignment and it's eerie and it's obviously it seems to you it's man-made other times it, it has a little magical touch you know about it they're in, uh, slightly invisible i like it like the concept of it each work is different but it's also the same Putting a work in context always makes them different. So every society you visit is very different. And every position or every piece of landscape is different. And that's what influences the work and creates the ambience around it. So yeah, they're absolutely the same, but they're all different. The next day, Andrew has to face his newest challenge, Site 2. This is where I'm going to build the Aquarary Eagle, which is a symbol of this town. But bad weather is closing in fast. What we'll do is we'll make that rock the corner of the square, and, right. we'll, and then we'll measure from that area. So the team the needs to lay out about 200 pegs a day to stay on schedule, but it's starting to look like the weather won't let them. It's about three degrees, and I think it'll snow this afternoon, so it's very cold. It's going to make the ground really difficult to work on because it's going to be slippery and it's steep. Work on this field and gather everything to this side of the road before we take It's going to make life harder. And I want to get about half the quantity. I want to move about 250 rocks up here over these next couple of days so we can keep building. But a few days later, the weather is even worse. They drive up the mountain in the morning to find the eagle site completely shrouded in fog. It's starting to feel like the forces of nature are conspiring against them. And it's certainly not what they expected from a summer in Iceland. It's incredible, like, fog all around us. A raining, but still, was so like just so remarkable. We had a visibility of like 200 feet. We were hearing all these strange sounds from the city. There's a ship construction going on by the harbor, and you can hear all those strange sounds coming through the fog. It was like being in the Lord of the Rings and just expecting some <laughs> trolls coming running towards you. <laughs> In fact, many locals do believe that trolls or elves could be living under the largest rocks on these sites. Icelandic elves are protected by law and can get very upset if their homes are disturbed. So Andrew agrees to leave their homes untouched. Site two, where they'll build the Akureyri Eagle, is next to a ski field, which will be full of skiers when winter comes. This delicate subalpine area is very fragile. Although covered in snow in winter, the ground is wet and muddy during the summer months. This is a very daunting site because 
you'll see that the big machinery really has trouble getting a grip. Andrew comes up with a solution. The rocks they need to build the sculpture are brought in from the nearby ski slopes, which need to be cleared of rocks anyway. Then movement of the heavy machines on the muddy ground is kept to an absolute minimum. Here you can see this machine has nearly cleared the last load of rocks where the tractor dropped them. He's slowly moving the pile up over here and when it's moved he'll move and then he'll move it again. That way there's less movement of the machinery. Then he'll take them further up the mountain and that you can see further up there the big machine it's doing the same thing. It's picking up a pile of rocks from down low and slowly moving it up the top. So what we're going to do this morning, right up the top there where you see the marker, is the bird's beak and head. And we're going to start this morning uh, outlining that form with the rocks. The Akari eagle is one of the endangered species of this area. There's only 100 pairs left. And it's one of the four protective symbols of Iceland. It is the, the dragon the bull, the giant, and, and the eagle. And it says that the eagle had such a huge wing spread that when it flew inside the fjord of Akuri, its wings touched the mountains on either side. Six days of freezing rain and mud and fog can't dampen Andrew's tenacity. As they put the finishing touches on the eagle, its form takes shape in the mist. Well, it's great to finish this site in particular because it's been so difficult with the weather and the stones and finding the materials and putting them in place in these conditions. It's really difficult, this weather. <laughs> Plus, it's very satisfying to complete this symbol that means so much to the people of Akareli. And I hope everybody, when they see the eagle, they think where that came from and the idea behind it and the mythology and think what went before. Legends of trolls and eagles make Andrew want to find out more about the environment that's given birth to these powerful tales. Iceland's extraordinary landscape of glaciers, volcanoes and lava flows has earned it the name of Land of Ice and Fire. It's Andrew's first chance to explore the island and take a rest in a cave fed by hot springs. All this water from we went through waterfalls, lava fields, and looking at active volcano activities with steam pouring from the ground. And all this goes so much better with a taste of dried shark, washed down with Black Death vodka. The dried shark has given Andrew a taste for more of Iceland's eccentrics. So he goes in search of a local farmer who builds and plays traditional musical instruments. He finds Helgi in the barn. Helgi's a great character. He's taken ancient Icelandic instruments and he's made them himself and he's taught himself to play them beautifully. Helgi's wife, Beata, is a very accomplished blacksmith and she's taken ancient Viking symbols and she recreates them in iron in a furnace. <laughs> I, I love the smell of the smoke and the charcoal. Yeah. Andrew has only one site to go, the symbol now, and he wants Beata to make him a copy in iron. So what we're building up here is 100 metres from the top to the bottom. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking if you could do something in metal, that, uh, to capture this image, yes. that'll be very nice to have something local. Yeah, so but not 100 meters. No, 100 meters is a bit big. 10, 10 centimeters. 10 centimeters okay. would be great.
Andrew begins scouting for Site 3, where the rune now will be built. A local farmer has provided his land on the other side of the fjord. We've spent a lot of time looking at it because it's a very sensitive area, it's a water catchment area, so we have to be careful not to place it anywhere where it's likely to damage the water supply. So what, what we are going to do here is we're building two land sculptures on that side and with your permission we build one on the top. But site three proves to be more challenging than Andrew anticipates. The local council now prefers a different location. Andrew has to find a new position on another farmer's land. The council selected one site for us which we laid out the form on and then they decided that it was too close to the water catchment area, so we're shifting it. Losing time on a site puts you under pressure. We have to mark out the position twice, so each time you do it takes two days. But this site turns out to be not suitable as well. The council of Svalbard City wanted to see the site when, and we had already staked it out, and they were concerned that the land might get damaged. It has a lot of snow and water. It's a very wet ground. So we decided to uh, move it up to the top of the mountain, which makes it a whole lot easier and the ground is not as fragile. It was very nice. We walked over this site with two farmers and the guy in charge of the municipality, and they're happy. We've just arrived at the beginning of site three about 650 metres above sea level. This letter now, this runic letter, dates back 3,000 years. And from here you can look over the fjord and you can see the eagle and you can see the rhythms of life. And so it's all one site. And the people in the town will look up and see all of these constructions. Andrew wants to start with this and let's try this. Let's try this. Yeah. Number one. The slope is not as steep as we used to. There's an abundance uh, amount of stones all over. The shape itself is quite simple. Uh, as you can see, one straight line, one, one very long curve. So not too many details, not too many sharp corners. Easy. The first one? Yeah. Rough and I didn't know what to do. So then I made this one. Mm -hmm. And I think it's better, but it's... Mm -hmm. mm? Looks more... Yeah, they're both nice. It's more civilized. Yeah. And then I did one like now, forever. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah. So that's But then it's not the same Yeah, thing, this is your art. That's great. But you know, this will be the only thing I take home that comes from here. Okay. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else. <laughs> okay. Except memories. After three days, the rune now is almost complete. Andrew and Golan can give it the finishing touches and appreciate the view. message is just as important as the form and for me rocks are very exciting because they've been part of history and part of civilization so I love it I love the smell of the earth and I love looking at the rocks and I like thinking who's walked around here before me and really what we're doing we're taking parts of nature and rearranging it that's really what we're doing Icelandic people have been really welcoming. They've embraced the project, they've supported it. They love their mythology. They can understand what I'm doing. It's really been a wonderful experience.